My name's Karen Chapman and I work in this building. I'm in the Centre for Cardiovascular Science on the third floor. Um, just to tell you, you're in one of three research buildings that belong to the University of Edinburgh on this site. There's this building, the Queen's Medical Research Institute. There's the Chancellor's buildings across the road attached to the main hospital and there's the Centre for Regenerative Medicine which is over on the, on the hill. So we do, we, this, in this building we have three research centres. We have um, the Centre for Reproductive Health on the ground floor. We have the Centre for Inflammation Research on the second floor. And then we have the Centre for Cardiovascular Science, as I mentioned, on the third floor. We're funded by a whole series of, of different bodies. And this particular lecture series, as well as a lot of our research, is funded by the Medical Research Council. And so we'll also hear tonight about some research that's funded by Diabetes UK and other organisations. So we're very grateful for the funding for our research. We have two speakers, as usual, for you tonight, but there's a little bit of difference. So the first speaker is Dr. Shireen Forbes. And Shireen um, has the next door office to me, so we, we're good friends upstairs. Um, and Shireen works here, and she's involved in the clinical care, as she'll tell you, of, of patients with diabetes. And she collaborates closely with Professor Kevin Doherty, who's come down from Aberdeen. Um, actually, and he's brought a, a couple of people, including his own daughter, with him tonight um, to listen to the talk. And so Kevin and Shireen collaborate very closely together on their research, as uh, they will tell you about tonight. So I'm going to hand over to Shireen. Thank you. So many thanks and um, a very warm welcome to you. Um, as Karen Chapman's just said, um, Professor Doherty and myself will speak about new and future therapies for type 1 diabetes. And just to give you an overview of the lecture tonight, I'll be speaking a little bit about the history of diabetes, and then I'll be going through one of the most remarkable discoveries in medicine, that of the discovery of insulin. I'll be speaking about the importance of blood glucose control and um, a little bit on the new insulins which have been developed for diabetes which help with control. And um, there'll be some information on the emerging and existent technology. And both Professor Doherty and myself will be talking about islet transplantation I'm the diabetologist on the islet transplant program for Scotland, which is based here at the Royal Infirmary. And Professor Doherty will be speaking further about his groundbreaking research in this field. So very simply, diabetes mellitus is diagnosed just on the glucose levels, but it's well recognized that fat metabolism and protein metabolism are, are also affected adversely. And this is the World Health Organization classification of diabetes. It shows a fasting glucose of greater than or equal to seven and a two hour glucose after ingestion of 75 grams of glucose of greater than or equal to 11.1. The term diabetes was actually introduced by the Greeks in around 100 AD and means to siphon, referring to the excessive urination seen with the condition. And mellitus actually comes from the Latin word, and this was introduced in 1675, and it means sweet, like honey. But diabetes has been recognized for an extremely long time. This is the Ebers Papyrus in 1550 BC, and it recognizes the symptoms of diabetes, overabundant urine, prescription includes bones, wheat grains, fresh grits, green lead earth and water. Let stand moist, strain it, and take it for four days. This treatment didn't work. And these are children with diabetes before effective drug therapy. So this was preceding 1921. And you can see that the children are wasted and the average survival was just one to three years after the diagnosis of diabetes. 
So what was available at this time? Well, very eminent physicians prescribed starvation diets. It wasn't especially evidence-based, um, and these were, as I said, promoted by physicians such as Joslin. And the theory was to keep carbohydrates very low so as to keep blood glucose levels low. We know that by keeping blood glucose levels low in certain conditions, we can actually reduce inflammation, and there may have been an element of um, reduced inflammation in the pancreas. But ultimately, this treatment did not work, and the patients wasted away and couldn't fight the um, variety of infections that they were exposed to. All of this changed. In the 1920s, Frederick Banting, who'd just returned from the First World War, he'd come back and he decided to work with a physiologist. Now, the physiologist asked him to give um, a lecture on carbohydrate metabolism. And Frederick Banting read some reports that when dogs had had their pancreases removed, they developed diabetes. He then started looking at the literature and he read a single case report of a patient who had a stone blocked in their pancreatic duct and all of the pancreas here actually degenerated and died except for this small part of the pancreas called the islets of Langerhans. And he questioned whether the secretion that controlled blood glucose came from the islets of Langerhans. So he went to Toronto and uh, he went to see John McLeod, who was an Abedonian, um, and he asked him if he could do some experiments in his lab. And Professor McLeod said yes and gave him the medical student Charles Best. And what they did was they got some dogs, they removed their pancreases, and the dog was then diabetic. They got the islets, they processed the islets, and they put them back into the diabetic dog. The blood glucose levels of the dog, which had originally obviously been high, the glucose levels came down. These were absolutely breakthrough experiments, and they got James Collip working on the process to try and purify the insulin further. And he produced um, a very pure extract of insulin just a few months later. The first person to receive insulin was Leonard Thompson on the 11th of January, 1922, just six months later. And the transformation was miraculous. You can see here he was wasted, and then just three months post-insulin, um, he'd actually put on weight and was extremely well. The process from bench to bedside was rapid. The patent for insulin was sold to the Canadian government for $1. Within a year, there was enough insulin to treat all patients in Canada and the US. If you contrast that with modern day times, most drugs take 10 years to get from the bench to the bedside. And now, instead of persons, people dying with their diabetes, people were able to live with their diabetes. And you can see here similar transformations. Weight could increase, and people became generally a lot more healthy. So, in 1923, Banting and McLeod were awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine, and they shared the sum of money with Best and Collip. And you can see McLeod's Nobel pin at the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh, where it's been gifted. And people can now live full lives, and Diabetes UK recognises much of the struggle that people have. And you can see here that the Nabarro medal, Alan Nabarro, um, was against discrimination shown to people with diabetes, and this medal is given to, to persons. Um, Robert Lawrence, of course, co-founded Diabetes UK, and McLeod is our Nobel laureate. 
just want to touch on the main types of diabetes. In this lecture tonight, we're concerned with type 1 diabetes. Um, and this is, um, comes about because of the destruction of beta cells, they're called, the insulin-producing cells, in the islets of Langerhans. And the body, for some reason, starts to destroy these cells. These patients are lacking in insulin, they're seldom overweight, and they're often diagnosed in childhood. As I said, I, I won't touch more on type 2 diabetes other than to say that these patients have um, a lack, a relative lack of beta cells. They're often resistant to the insulin that they're making, they're often overweight, and they tend to be much older. So... It's now known that um, the pancreas has these islets of Langerhans in, and about 2% of the pancreas consists of these islets of Langerhans. And within the islets, there are, as I said, these beta-insulin-producing cells. And diabetes results because of the destruction of these cells. And if you don't remember anything else from this lecture, please remember the symptoms of diabetes. So these are Diabetes UK, the 4Ts campaign, increased um, going to the toilet, increased urination, increased thirst, increased tiredness, weight loss, that's the thinner, maybe symptoms associated with diabetes. The prevalence of diabetes, well, it's about 5 in 1,000 um, are affected in the UK. Um, the commonest age group affected are 10 to 14 years of age, but it can occur um, in later life too. Males and females are affected in equal proportions, and many people remain um, unaware of the symptoms, and many children are seriously unwell before they're diagnosed. And these patients who are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes are reliant on insulin injections. But people with diabetes, with type 1 diabetes, often walk a tightrope, and if they give themselves too much insulin, they may make their blood glucose levels low. This is called hypoglycemia, and they get symptoms of trembling, dizziness, shakiness. And conversely, if they give themselves too little insulin, their blood sugar goes high, so they're hyperglycemic, and they may have what we call osmotic symptoms. They might want to go to the toilet a lot. They might have blurred vision, tiredness, etc. And these can be extremely dangerous conditions, may lead to coma, and can have life-threatening consequences. And there are long-term consequences of running very high blood glucose levels. Um, it can affect a number of organs in the body, the eyes, kidneys, nerves, heart, brain. And the longer-term consequences of running repeatedly low blood glucose can affect the ability to sense the symptoms. So in other words... After a while, many people do not get shaky, dizzy, sweaty. They can collapse without warning. We know from many different studies that glucose control absolutely matters, and better control means a longer lifespan and fewer complications ultimately from diabetes. But when people have intensified their testing and intensified the amount of insulin that they have given themselves, their blood glucose readings and the number of hypos, number of hypoglycemic episodes that they have, increases. So what are the therapies that can actually reduce this incidence of hypoglycemia and maybe even increase um, um, or improve uh, blood glucose control? Well, in the 1980s, altered forms of insulin called insulin analogues were man-made. And what you can see here is the insulin chain. And substitution of a single amino acid in the insulin chain 
can radically alter the properties of that insulin. So it can affect the rate of absorption and it can reduce the amount of episodes, for example, of hypoglycemia and control hyperglycemia. So here you can see a, a profile of um, a regular type of insulin, like insulin act rapid, it was called. But these new analogues, um, by changing the um, amino acid, can alter here. You can see that this insulin is absorbed more quickly and um, disappears out of the body more quickly. So these have been useful um, drugs to really improve blood glucose control. And things are changing all the time, and there are more and more insulin analogues that are coming onto the market. So it's worth always finding out whether there's a new um, insulin on the market which might suit um, yourself or, um, or, or someone that you know with, with diabetes. The other um, thing that's really changed in recent time and, and improved control in many patients are insulin pumps. Now, insulin pumps continuously infuse rapid-acting insulin, and you can see here the pump, which the patient programs, and it runs in through this cannula and goes into the subcutaneous tissue, so in other words, the tissue below the skin. And this pump here might be worn with a sensor. So you can see, that, again, the glucose sensor sits within the subcutaneous tissue. And this can Bluetooth across to the pump. And if the glucose is detected to be low, the pump actually switches off. However, the pump is not capable of minute-to-minute um, -minute fine tuning, and the patient actually has to program the pump otherwise to um, suit their needs. And there can be problems with the pump. There can be mismatches between what the glucose is reading in the tissues and what the blood glucose is. And there might be um, infection sites, for example. So it's not, it doesn't suit absolutely everyone. Now, glucose monitoring sensors have really been a focus of... Um, the technological companies, and Abbott have made this sensor, which is coming on the market um, in a few weeks' time, in fact. And the way in which it's different is that this sensor can sit in the tissue for two weeks. The patient can scan the sensor um, and learn what their um, glucose readings are at that, min at that point in time. And they've also got predictive value so that the sensor can actually show the patient whether or not they're about to go down or whether their blood gl glucose is about to go up. And it's revolutionized um, monitoring in that um, there's far fewer blood glucose testing. The one that I think is really interesting is um, the glucose monitoring via the um, eye. So this is, you can see this... Um, monitoring system which sits over the eye and samples the glucose. And this is being developed with Microsoft. And when the glucose is noted to be low, the lens actually changes color so the patient actually sees red and might be prompted to actually eat something. There are other systems in development. You can see here this works on um, ultras uh, ultrasonic um, uh, technology. This goes onto the ear and can uh, measure glucose in this fashion. And they've been working on a watch that might actually sense glucose as well, and this is in further development. But what about a cure for diabetes? Well, I mentioned islet transplantation at the start, and Islet transplantation certainly reduces the frequency of hypoglycemia. So this is a process where a donor pancreas is um, isolated in the lab and the islets are transplanted into the patient with type 1 diabetes. And in those patients who have lost the awareness 
of hypoglycemia, they actually regain their awareness again. And it's really the only therapy, <coughs> cell therapy, that, that can really help with regaining awareness. But there are drawbacks. The patients require immunosuppression, so that's anti-rejection therapy, which can be associated with an increased risk of cancer, and up to three transplants may be necessary, and as Professor, as Professor Doherty will um, mention later, um, donor shortage is a major issue. So islet transplantation has been commissioned in the UK, um, and it was commissioned in April 2008, and you can see that there are seven centres currently in the UK. The Centre for Scotland is based here at the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh, and we have an islet isolation centre here. And our Scotland-wide islet transplant programme was started in Edinburgh in 2010. And one aspect of it is obviously the clinical side of the programme, and here you can see many, many people who are involved in the clinical side of the programme. So it's the um, uh, transplant surgeons, the diabetologists, the diabetes team in the lab. And one person who um, uh, warrants particular mention is John Casey, who's the transplant surgeon who established the programme here in 2010. But there's a very strong scientific programme here. And of course, um, Professor Doherty is very much leading the way with his science here as well. In our patient assessment, we look to see how severely the patient is, has impaired awareness of their hypoglycemia, and we obviously do a very careful assessment, assessment of their risk of cancer from immunosuppression, so we need to make sure that they don't have any pre-existent cancer, and the assessment process is, is, is very, very long. And this is the islet transplant process itself. Human donor pancreas goes to the lab. Islets are isolated and purified in the uh, blood transfusion laboratory. They go to radiology at the Royal. The patient has their vein, main vein in the liver um, cannulated, and the islets are actually infused and go into the liver. And... This was our first patient who was transplanted. And what you can see here is that before her transplant, each um, colour, each line represents um, a day. Uh, and this is her glucose monitoring system. And you can see that her blood glucose area is way off target. The target would be the green area. And she was exposed to hypoglycemic episodes and would be found um, collapsed in the street. A week after her first transplant, her blood glucose control is hugely better, and you can see that her blood glucose levels are within this green area. And a week after her second islet transplant, our patient was off insulin, and her blood glucose control was um, really very tight, as you can see. This is um, one of our patients, Keith Bailey, a 54-year-old patient, he, again, gave a similar story of often being found collapsed in the street. And he um, said to us that he feels that now he has not only his hypoglycemic awareness back, but he feels that you know, he can resume his running and he feels that his life is normal again and it's nothing short of a miracle. And Paul Orr, um, a 40-year-old patient... He now feels that he can sense his hypos once more. And the main thing that it's given him is independence. And it's also given his wife a break. And this is a kind of recurrent story, really, that we see in our transplant clinic. Lastly, just to show you a summary of islet transplantation, in um, 2010, as I said, we joined the islet program in the, in the UK. And... Scotland's transplants have actually made up 50% of the entire UK activity in the last two years. But as you can see with the red, there's not enough donor organs to meet need. So with that, I'll hand over to Professor Doherty. So, so thank you very much, uh, Dr Forbes. 
Just by way of introduction, I should explain that I, I work in this building, the uh, Institute of Medical Sciences, located at the University of Aberdeen. Uh, I'm a, an island biologist by training, and in the last uh, few years or so, I've actually uh, acquired the skills, my lab has acquired the skills of working with stem cells, so I could call myself a stem cell biologist as well as an island biologist. And I've been working very closely with the team here in Edinburgh. At a very early stage, uh, in fact, for almost 10 years now, we've been really focusing on these uh, problems related to uh, the future of islet transplantation. And really, we can summarize these as, as Dr. Forbes has really you know, uh, beautifully described. The fact that we have to acquire up to three donors per recipient, there is a certain graph failure that occurs over time. So we see 10% function after five years or so, and this shortage of donor tissue. And this is really where, where I come in. So we've really focused our, our discussions. Is there a role for stem cell biology or reprogramming in taking this, this form of treatment forward? So let me just say a few things about, about islets of Langerhans. So these, these, this is what we've referred to as islets. So this is what a pancreas looks like. Um, I put this up because um, you won't see a pancreas again, they'll all be schematics. And the, and the point I want to make is that this the pancreas is linked up to the small intestine, and the major function of the pancreas is to secrete digestive juices into the, the, the lumen of the pancreas and the lumen of the gut, where uh, these, these um, enzymes are involved in the breakdown of, of food in the gut. Um, these cells represent about 98% of the tissue of the pancreas. The islets represent a very small amount. So that when we talk about an islet um, preparation for transplantation, this is what it looks like. It's very much a, a preparation of cells. So it's already it's cell therapy. Um, and what we really need to understand, so this is, this is what they look like. So if we put them in a dish, so if I take that, that tube and I, I pour them in a dish, and we regularly get material that's left over that, that's not put into patients from the team in Edinburgh, it's sent up to us in Aberdeen for research purposes. And if I put it into a dish, this is what it looks like. I can uh, stain it with a, a, a chemical that detects the insulin. Um, so I, I can easily visualize these things. But the thing about an islet is that it's what I call terminally <coughs> differentiated. So we're, we're familiar with the idea that you can take cells of the body, such as skin cells, for skin grafts, you can put them in a dish, and these cells will grow in a dish. These cells are not terminally differentiated. They can grow and divide. Islet cells don't have that capacity. So depict it this way. So if I take my islet cells and I put them in a flask, and if I have about a thousand or so islet cells in my flask, and if I look at my flask four days later, or even seven days later, I see no growth. I have the same number of islets. Islets do not grow. They are what I call terminally differentiated. But there are other cell types that do grow, and I've mentioned one, these are skin cells. But another type of cell is a stem cell. So if I take a stem cell and I put it in a flask, and I look at those, that flask, over a time period, what I see is that these cells are dividing. They're increasing in number. They're proliferating in that culture dish. And in fact, if I get to this stage, this is, we, 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 this is a, a confluent culture. It's, if I left it in there, there wouldn't be enough nutrients and these cells would die. So what we would do is I would divide these cells into 10 new dishes and then grow them further. So you can see from this simple illustration that I can grow unlimited amounts of stem cells. I can grow them up, I can divide them, and so on over a longer period of time. But if we look more closely at the property of a stem cell, a stem cell is, by definition, is a stem cell that can divide, as I've just said, and create another stem cell. But also under certain conditions, a stem cell can differentiate to form any other, well, can form another cell type. So, and, and this is why I was careful there, because some cell types can form any cell in the body, other cell, cell stem cells are what we call, uh, um, uh, they're, they're, they're stem cells that have a specific function. So, the sources of stem cells, we have adult stem cells, 
embryonic stem cells or induced, what we call induced pluripotent stem cells. So an example of an, an adult stem cell would be a, a stem cell that's present in the wall of the small intestine. And what we're looking at here is the lumen of the gut, which is full of these structures called villi. The villi are there to provide a larger surface area to facilitate absorption of food from the gut. You can imagine that there's quite a bit of wear and tear on these cells, so they're continually being removed from the gut. So, we, so the gut needs to replace them. And it does this using, and the word I was looking for earlier on was, is a professional stem cell. It's a stem cell that's present here. Very few of them. They're, they're really very rare cells, but they, but they have a, an extremely important function. So this is a stem cell at the base of the villi here, which can uh, produce another stem cell, but it can also produce these cells which go on to what we call differentiate. So they differentiate into any of the cells that are present in the lining of these villi. Another example of, and we call these either professional or unipotent stem cells. Another type of stem cell is the stem cell in bone marrow. So we have cells in the bone marrow, and we're familiar with, with, from, from this from bone marrow transplantation. So we have cells in bone marrow, uh, and these stem cells can give rise to all of the blood types that are present in the blood. So these are our, all our white blood cells, and there are various types of white blood cells, as well as red blood cells. And in addition, they can give rise to fat cells and so on. And we call these multipotent stem cells. Now, the point about these, these unipotent and multipotent stem cells is that, yes, they can behave as stem cells in a culture, but no one has yet been able to induce these to differentiate into pancreas. So for that reason, when, when we first started um, discussing the problem with, with, our, our, with my colleagues in Edinburgh, we, we turned, so just to summarize my, our adult stem cells, present in most tissues, give rise to specific cell types, so I used the word professional, limitations, they're very rare cell type, difficult to identify. We know that there's likely to be stem cells in the pancreas, stem cells in the liver, stem cells in brain, for example, but they're really, really rare, difficult to identify, and even experts in this field will argue at length over the identity of these particular cell types. On the other, the other hand, we have other types of cells that can give rise to any cell in the body. And, and here I just want to introduce the concept of pluripotency. It's not, it's not a particularly difficult concept, and that is that following fertilization of an egg, we have this sperm and an egg come together to, to generate a fertilized egg, and at some point there is a cell that's generated that can give rise to any cell, in the, there's 200 or so different cell types in the body. So this cell, which we call a pluripotent cell, can give rise to any of these tissues. And that's what a, an embryonic stem cell is. So an embryonic stem cell is a, a, a cell that has been, an egg that has been fertilized in vitro. And within that egg, there, there are cells which, which we call inner mass cells, cells of the, of the inner cell mass. We can take these cells, place them in a culture dish, and they will attach to the dish and grow in culture because they're stem cells, they will expand, they will replicate. It's difficult to get them to do this, but if, once you have the skills, because they don't want to be stem cells, they want to be something else when they're in the culture dish. But once you have the skills, you can actually expand these, and as I say, you can put them into fresh culture dishes and so on. So you can actually get unlimited numbers of these cells. So as I said, and I'm just coming back to this again, inner cell masses in cell culture, and we can expand them. We can culture and grow our ES cells in a culture dish. But we can then trick them into becoming something else. And that's where the skill comes in. Of course, in my lab, I want them to become pancreas. Other people that are interested in liver or neurons will want them to go down these lineages. So the question is, how do we do this? Or more importantly, can we do this? And how do we do this? Well. So they're generated from the inner cell mass, well characterized, and they're pluripotent. Understanding how we get these to become pancreas really is dependent on our, on our, on our knowledge 
of how pancreas develops in an embryo. And this is, these are pictures of a mouse embryo. And again, I don't want to oversimplify it, um, but what we know is that the pancreas appears at an early stage, and what I'm looking at here is a gut tube. So early in the developing embryo, a gut tube forms. There's a portion of the gut tube that then, that then gives rise to buds. And from these buds, we have two, two particular um, regions that, um, that grow, proliferate, and then come together to form the pancreas. So we know this in great detail, and we know the molecules that control these events. So in essence, what we'd like to do is to recapitulate this, th these series of events in a culture dish. So essentially, I want to, to, to take my, my um, uh, knowledge of the growing pancreas, and if I, can, I think my thumb's too big for this thing, I apologize for that. I think I need to do stem cells to induce formation of a better adapted thumb. But we have, but what I'm depicting here, these are, these are what we call factors. So, so they, they, may, they don't mean a lot to you. This is nodal, retinoic acid, FGF, delta notch. But, but the, the point is that we know what controls the sequence of events that allows this pancreas to start as a bit of cut, gut tube and end up as a functional islet of Langerhans. So what I want to do is to take my ES cells in a culture dish, and I just add these reagents. So I, I, instead of nodal, I add a compound called activin, and so on. And at each stage, I'm controlling this pathway. It's particularly tricky here, because at this point, the pancreas actually wants to become liver. So I, so I, I have not only to force it along a pan towards pancreas, I have to stop it becoming liver. And we can do that, because we know the kind of tricks that, that we can apply. How do we know we're making uh, these particular cell types? Oh my god. <laughs> 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 I'm new at this business. I've only been, t I only been doing it for about 30 odd years, <laughs> three times a week. <laughs> I'll get used to it. Anyway. So what we do is we can measure proteins. So these, what we have these, th these are proteins that, and the term is expressed, they are made at each of these stages. And these proteins provide us what is, in essence, a barcode. So I know that at this stage, I, I've, reached, I've reached this point here. I've reached this, this point where the pancreas is emerging because I have a barcode for what's happening here. Again, all the way through. And I've just highlighted in red, th these are particularly important proteins. These are the proteins <coughs> that drive these events. And um, I'll come back to those later because, as it turns out, our strategy will have evolved from this. So, so that this is essentially how we go about it. Um, what do the data look like? So this is what an ES cell looks like in culture. It's, it's a, it, they clump together, they look very uniform, and if I leave this as it is, as I say, it will replicate and divide. And I have a marker here, the chemical, the, the colors it green, that tells me that this is a, a proliferating ES cell. As I then add my reagents and I form the gut tube, I get a different appearance. I get different chemical uh, uh, markers coming up as I go along here, and so on. I've got to this stage here, and you can see that almost all of the cells are like this. So it's, it's actually happening at high efficiency. And finally, I get to this point here, and so on. So, so, the, so the point of this part of my talk is, is that we now have the skills to efficiently, and the word I use is differentiate ES cells into functional islets that can be used in transplantation. And there are a number of companies that are now going into clinical trials with this as a form of therapy. As these studies were going on, there was something momentous happened. Every now and again in science, there's something stunning occurs that makes you change your whole approach, your whole attitude. I actually call this the Yamanaka experiment, and it was performed in Kyoto in 2006. And this is a chap here, Shinya Yamanaka, and he shared the Nobel Prize with Sir John Gurdon in 2012. 
And what he did was incredibly remarkable. It was based on work that John Gurdon published in the 1970s. And what John Gurdon showed was that you could take a frog egg and you could remove the nucleus from that egg, the genetic material, and you could take the genetic material from an adult frog, from a cell from an adult frog, put it into that egg, and you could generate a new frog from that adult nuclei. And that was essentially, he had, John Gurdon had induced pluripotency in a frog. We thought that that was something that you could only do with amphibians until Ian Wilmot and his colleagues in Edinburgh came along and they cloned Dolly. And again, Dolly was, it was, was a remarkable achievement. I mean, we're all wondering, you know, where, what came out of Dolly? Well, Yamanaka's experiment came out of Dolly. It was really important because Ian Wilmot showed that you could do the same. So you could take uh, uh, an egg from a sheep, you could remove the nucleus, you could take uh, a nucleus from an adult cell from the sheep, put it into the egg, and generate a cloned sheep dolly. Now, that, that was great, but what Yamanaka did was said, right, let's see if we can do this in a cultured dish. He, was, he took a cell in a cultured dish, a skin cell, and it turns out we could do it with any cell, and he made it pluripotent. I mean, when I read the paper, I thought, this is nonsense. It's just against everything I've learned in biochemistry. And that's how groundbreaking the work was. But it was re replicated within months. It took, it took uh, two years to replicate Dolly. It took uh, three months to replicate the Yamanaka experiment. So simply what Yamanaka tells us is that we've got this concept of pluripotency, which I've just int already introduced to you. The fact that we have a fertilized egg and we have a cell, a pluripotent cell, and the dogma was, this is irreversible, so you will never get a pancreas going back to backwards along this route. <laughs> Differentiation is linear and it's non-reversible. What Yamanaka essentially did was he took, he took, initially it was skin cells, but we can do it now from, from any cell. It's now accepted, published in 2007, seven years later, this is now accepted, that you can take any, any cell in the body, any cell in the body, and induce it. We can induce pluripotency. And Yamanaka did it with what we call a cocktail. It was a cocktail of proteins. We call it OSKM. It doesn't really matter what it stands for. It was incredibly simple, the way in which he got it to work. And of course, as I say now, we can do it through a variety of ways. But in terms of the conversation I was having with my colleagues in Edinburgh, what it meant, actually, was that we could take any, any tissue in the body and, and, and change them into any other type of cell. So essentially, we could start discussing making pancreas from another cell type. And in fact, this is the approach that, that, that we suggested. So, so in Edinburgh, they take the pancreas, they isolate the islets, and they put them into patients. Here's my little schematic. Very proud of this. Again, 30 years of the game, and I've suddenly mastered PowerPoint. <laughs> and what I suggested to him is, why don't you send the residual material? This is the exocrine. Remember what I said earlier on was that the bulk of the pancreas, 98% of the pancreas, is exocrine. This is the stuff that makes the digestive juices that go into the gut. That's, and that's normally thrown away. So I said, why don't you send this up to us in Aberdeen, and what we'll do is we'll reprogram it. And Yamanaka has told us it, that, that biochemically, physiologically, we should be able to reprogram it. And of course, we'd make some reprogrammed islets and send them back down to Edinburgh. The advantage of this, as we saw, was that this patient who's been transplanted is potentially waiting for other transplants, other donors. If we can get this to work, we can send the material down so it doesn't have to wait for donors, we could cryopreserve this material, and it could be used as a top-up supply. That's the idea. Does it work? The answer is it better than we could have expected. And again, the strategy that we, we use goes back to the scenario that I provided earlier on related to the development of the pancreas. This is just another way of presenting it. This is the exocrine material here. And what I'm showing here is, is that during development, we have a gut tube, we then have the pancreas developing, and there is a common cell that gives rise to both this lineage and to this lineage here, which is the one that we want. So essentially, when I get my material, or we get our material from Edinburgh, 
What I want to do is to take this material and convert it into that material. And we know that there are key proteins that can control this. So what we do is we take that material and we add these key proteins to the culture. So this is what it looks like. So this is in Edinburgh, the islet fraction goes into individuals for transplantation, exocrine fraction goes to us, we culture it, and we, 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 we add our proteins, our four proteins, into it, and we end up with functional islets. So we're actually recreating. It's not a replenishable supply, so we haven't got a mass production of islets, but we have enough islets that will actually benefit the patient that's already been transplanted in Edinburgh. <coughs> The data have actually gone incredible. We've been extremely pleased with, with the data. And what I'm showing here is the insulin content. We express it as the amount of insulin within the cells as, as the amount of protein. So if we look at uh, human islets, and this is three donors, you can see that there's very little variation from these error bars. There's very little variation between the donors in terms of the insulin content. This is the reprogrammed cell. So this is the X crime material. They don't make any insulin. This is our reprogrammed cell. It makes 15% at the moment. Our cell population is not pure, so it's probably higher than that. So I reckon in this experiment, we're close to, say, 20 30%. That is of therapeutic value. We know that when, a patient, when someone comes into the clinic with the early symptoms of diabetes, there is residual 20% uh, uh, pancreatic activity before they come in. So we're actually reaching a level which is therapeutically relevant. The other criteria, is it functional? And again, the way in which we do our functional is that we, we use diabetic mice. So we make the mice diabetic and we, we place our cells that we make under the kidney. So what we do is we expose the kidney here and there's a, a, a sort of lining of, of soft tissue over the kidney, it's called the capsule, and we just inject the cells under the capsule, push the kidney back in again, and uh, this is, there, there's the cells here, sitting nicely under the kidney capsule. Um, and this is what happens. And again, just to, to show you, this is the blood glucose levels in these mice. We use a drug called STZ to make them diabetic, and here they are, the diabetic mice. Blood glucose levels have increased quite dramatically. We've taken them out over 30-odd days here, uh, and if we put in our cells, we rescue the diabetes. So they make enough insulin to be therapeutically of value, and they are functionally of value because they rescue diabetes in a mouse. If we remove the kidney from this mouse, they, and that is the, the kidney containing the cells, the mice then become diabetic. Okay, so, so I, I want to end on, on that positive note. And in fact, we're, we're quite excited in terms of the team in Aberdeen and uh, Edinburgh in terms of, 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 of the progress and where we can go in, in terms of taking this to the clinic. But I just wanted to end with, with, with this uh, uh, concept that really science is about a multidisciplinary approach. And the best example was in 1922 where we had Fred Banting was a surgeon working with a physician under the supervision of a biochemist along with a, with a chemist to help in the production, the discovery, and the production of insulin. And that the work that we are doing now is also very much disciplinary. We have John Casey, who's a surgeon. And again, John and I have worked together for about 10 years or so. Maria Jao Lima, stem cell biologist, sitting here in the front row. Uh, we have Kenny Muir, who works in my lab, who's a physician. And we have Hilary uh, Doherty, who's an endocrinologist. So again, very much a team based. And as we move to this next phase, we actually bring in people from the blood transfusion service that can help us with clinical grade material and help us further characterize our cells. As I think we quite rightly start thinking about how we can take this into the clinic. And I couldn't come down here uh, at this date without showing you this. <laughs> we, don't have a, we don't have a lot to laugh about in Aberdeen. <laughs> that there's a, a group of people with smiles on their face. And the final thing is, again, we couldn't do this without our various funders. You'll see that Diabetes UK are prominent in funding this work, along with the uh, Medical Research Council uh, and a variety of other funding agencies. So I'd like to just end on that note. Thank you.